Galatians. You might recall we were going through 2 Corinthians the last time that I was here. We finished up 2 Corinthians, and I looked across the page, and I said, let's just go right over to Galatians. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to try and cover one verse. See if we can... <laughs> Although we're going we're gonna to look at a lot of verses today. I so. was going to read scripture. I didn't even do that. Mm, yeah, well, I will. <laughs> and uh, Linda's handing out some outlines so you can follow along because, like I say, we have uh, several other passages that we're going to be comparing and bringing into our message. I've often been asked the question, of, well, what kind of church uh, is, is your church? And uh, I will say, well, a grace church. And what's the next question they have? What's that? <laughs> what's a grace church? Uh, most people have a general idea of what a, uh, a Baptist church is or a Presbyterian church or a Catholic church. But um, what is a grace church? And, you know, we could point to a lot of things that uh, perhaps distinguish a grace church. Uh, we emphasize uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've probably heard that verse a few times here, 2 Timothy 2.15. Um, but really at the heart of it, there's one central fact that distinguishes a grace church from many others, and that is the fact that we understand that God appointed the apostle Paul as the apostle of the Gentiles. And so we're going to be emphasizing that today because that's what's emphasized in our text. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And we'll be uh, expounding on that verse, as I said, and comparing several others in order to understand just exactly what uh, the Apostle is, is communicating here by inspiration as he begins this epistle to the Galatians. Now, uh, Lord willing, in two weeks we'll be back. We'll be continuing on in the, 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 uh, uh, quite a few more verses in Galatians, but it mentions in verse 2, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Uh, many of Paul's epistles are written to a singular church, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and so forth. Uh, some are written to individuals, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. But this particular epistle is written to an entire region of churches, and that is the Galatian region. And Galatia uh, is named after the Gauls. Anybody know who the Gauls are? The Gauls came out of the area that we would now know as France and uh, moved into that region. They pretty much took over the area. It's, it's kind of the mid to northern section of Asia Minor, what we would call Turkey today. And they were eventually sort of pushed out uh, by the Romans or subdued by the Romans when uh, they came to power. Um, one of the characteristics of the people in that area is that they were rather fickle. And they could change their minds in quite a hurry. Now, people are like that today as well. But um, there was certainly a problem with that uh, that Paul addresses in the book of Galatians. Because what we're going to find as we go through this book is the fact that Paul had brought the gospel of grace to the Galatian people. But soon after he left, uh, the people we often call the Judaizers, those from Jerusalem, came to uh, Galatia, and they would travel behind Paul, and they would often then try and bring the new believers who had been saved by grace through faith, tried to bring them back under the law with its circumcision and all the rituals that go along with the law of Moses. So that's really what he's going to be addressing throughout this book. We are going to also emphasize the fact that Paul's apostleship is unique and distinct from the apostleship of the Twelve. One of the things I've found over the years, and it's just pretty typical of Christians of all stripes, 
that they somehow believed Paul was one of the 12 apostles. And uh, the fact is, nothing could be further from the truth. And Paul's going to actually spend almost the entire first and on into the second chapter explaining that he's not one of the 12 apostles. That his message was distinct from theirs, his ministry was distinct from theirs, and uh, he, will, he will go into quite a bit of detail in pointing out that fact. We'll, uh, uh, Lord willing, a little later, we'll show some of those distinctions between those two apostleships. Um, we're going to begin with the first verse today where we will see the source of Paul's apostleship. Now, before we do that, I want to talk about uh, apostles in general. The word apostle simply means one sent forth. So that's pretty general, one sent forth. Uh, there's really a, a twofold purpose to apostleship. And I want to make it clear, we're going to discuss this a bit more detail later, but um, there are no apostles today, okay? Uh, many churches claim to have apostles. But the scripture teaches that apostles were a part of the foundation that was laid for the church, the body of Christ. And um, after you're done with the foundation, you start building on that, and you don't need apostles anymore. But I want to show you a couple of uh, functions of an apostle, and we'll see that out of the book of Ephesians. So just one more book past Galatians. And uh, there are really two purposes of an apostle. Number one was to receive divine revelation from God. Now again, we, um, we believe that we have a completed Bible. Now I think most Christians would agree with that, although there are groups of Christians that claim to continue to receive revelations from God. Uh, the apostle Paul uh, wrote that it was given unto him to fulfill pleroma in the Greek, literally fill up the word of God. But in Ephesians chapter 3, we have an example of this purpose of apostleship was to receive revelation. Verse 1, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Okay, by the way, could Paul have said that a little differently, maybe so we'd understand it better? that Paul's the apostle for the Gentiles. Yeah, it's pretty clear, isn't it? If ye have heard, verse 2, of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore, in few words. So there's a prime example of the first purpose of an apostle, and that was to receive revelation from God. In this case, from Christ particularly, Paul was receiving the revelation of the mystery, or literally the secret, and this was a new revelation at the time it was given. It was not part of the old revel, the previous revelation of the prophecies of the Old Testament, so forth. This was something new. God was giving to Paul for specifically for the Gentiles. The second purpose of an apostle was to establish. God's work on the earth. When the new dispensation of grace that Paul refers to in verse 2 was revealed to him, God wanted it to quickly become established and grounded, and so he used apostles to do that. Now again, when I say apostles, don't always just automatically think 12 apostles. There were also other apostles besides them under the grace program. Paul is certainly the chief of those, but there were other apostles of grace. Now, when you look in chapter 4, we have an example of what their function was to be. Verse uh, 11, Ephesians 4, 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the perfect uh, knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And, and actually, by comparing Scripture with Scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, where he talks about the fact that someday the tongues would cease, the prophecies would stop being given, because God would complete his revelation. 
And so during that time, their ministry was to bring that grounding. Why? So verse 14, that we be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So as the revelation of the mystery was given to the Apostle Paul for the Gentiles, then the purpose of an apostle faded away eventually so that now we have the completed word of God. All right. Now let's talk about um, what Paul explains in the first verse of Galatians. We're going to see him approach it from a negative standpoint first and then a positive standpoint. Uh, negatively, Paul says, Paul, an apostle... Not of men, neither by man. So uh, let's talk about what he means by that. Not of men. Now this statement was important because many of the, the, the teachers of Paul's day were claiming to be apostles. And if you'll remember, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, 11, Paul made it clear that not everybody that claimed to be an apostle was a genuine apostle. Look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Well, you can understand, when you look at the big picture, as God was setting Israel aside. By the way, Dwight mentioned the conference in Wall Lake. And if you can get there, I, I think you'll really enjoy it. We're going to be talking about what happened to Israel. And we're going to go through Romans 9, 10, and 11, which explains Israel's past, present, and future. A lot of news about Israel these days, isn't there? And a lot of preachers. I mean, I've heard some pretty foundational, um, you know, preachers, you'd know their names, who are saying, oh, we've got just a couple months left. Have you heard any of that lately? Um, every time something happens in the Middle East, it's like, okay, and here's prophecy being fulfilled. Well, no, we actually need to understand we're still in the dispensation of grace. Prophecy is not being fulfilled today. It will be, by the way, next time prophecy is fulfilled, it's going to be the great tribulation period. Okay, So you don't want to be around for that. You want to be a believer and get out of here before then. But uh, a lot of confusion about that. We're going to be talking about that. But when God revealed the dispensation of grace to Paul for the Gentiles, you can imagine how Satan wanted to get his finger in the pie to uh, confuse people. And so he sent out his own emissaries claiming to be apostles, and Paul points his finger right at that and says that they're false apostles, they're deceitful, and um, no marvel, that shouldn't surprise us, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed. So when Paul writes to the Galatians, he's really addressing this problem of men who are coming up with their own apostleship. And, and Paul says, my apostleship is not of men. It's not of human origin. But then, uh, secondly, he says, not of men, neither by man. Now, what does he mean by that? What's the difference between being of men or by man? Well, to be of men would be human origin, that man just has come up with his own apostleship. By man would be to somehow try to convey apostleship onto someone else. And what that's known as, popularly or in, in um, theology, is apostolic succession. Have you ever heard of that, that term? Apostolic succession. And that's the idea that um, you can lay hands on a person, you can confer apostleship uh, to another human being. Um, just as an example, the Roman Catholic Church uh, believes that. And so uh, they claim to have 12 apostles and that when one dies or retired, do you retire from being an apostle? I'm not sure how that works. Uh, yeah, you get another one. Now, the basis for doing that is actually 
from the book of Acts. So I just want to go back there and point out what happened back in Acts chapter 1 where you do find the appointment of an apostle. Okay? Now, why did you need an appointment of an apostle back in Acts chapter 1? Now, get your mindset. Back in Acts chapter 1, we're talking about 12 apostles, right? Paul's not in a picture. He wasn't even saved then. He's, uh, he's not even mentioned at this point in the Bible. And so, um, we all know what happened to Judas, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here he goes. <laughs> Uh, verse uh, 15, Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, of the number of names together were about 120, uh, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity falling headlong. He burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Um, sorry to drop that on you right before lunch, but <laughs> uh, you know, it's been argued, well, something's wrong here. He, the Bible says he hanged himself, but here it says he's, he fell headlong and the bowels gushed out. Well, maybe the rope broke, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe he hung out there long enough that it kind of rotted away. I, who knows what all happened, but... Uh, not a very pretty sight. And so Peter, uh, uh, according to prophecy, says this was prophesied, and, and of course it was. Um, verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men, now what Peter's doing here is now giving the parameters of what would make someone eligible to replace Judas. Now understand, this wasn't something that would be going on for 2,000 years every time an apostle died. This was a one-time thing to replace Judas. And you'll note that uh, after James was beheaded in Acts chapter 12 by Herod, there's no... no convention called to replace him, they understood uh, what was going on. By the way, by that time, um, you know, Saul had been saved on the road to Damascus, and he's about to be sent out as the apostle of the Gentiles in Acts chapter 13. So um, other than Judas, you don't find an apostolic appointment, uh, succession, anything like that. And uh, notice the requirements Verse 21, Acts 1, 21. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must be one ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So there's really three requirements spelled out by Peter to replace Judas to become one of the twelve apostles. You had to be a part of their group, beginning with the baptism of John. Why there? Because that's when Christ was publicly revealed to be the Messiah. That's what John talked about in John chapter 1. And he says that, I, you know, I didn't really know him, but God had, the Father had told me that the one on whom the Spirit descends, he's the one. And when John would go baptizing that's how Christ was announced to Israel as the Messiah. And that, of course, took place at the beginning of his three-year ministry. And so one of the requirements is you had to be with them from that point. You had to be with them throughout that period from the baptism of John all the way to the resurrection of Christ. And you had to be one who had witnessed him or seen him after he rose from the dead. Now, would Paul have qualified according to these requirements? No, he wasn't with them from the baptism of John. He wasn't a follower of Christ throughout his entire three-year ministry. Now, he did see him in the resurrection, and we'll see that a little later too, but uh, he, uh, he would not have qualified to be one of the 12 apostles. He was an apostle of a different sort. Paul is very clear. In verse 1 of Galatians, 
His apostleship was not of men, not of human origin, neither was it by man. It wasn't conferred on him by anyone. And now he turns to the positive side of what he wants to communicate. And that's in the second half of verse 1, where he says, But by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Now this statement, but by Jesus Christ, is crucial to Paul's argument throughout the book of Galatians. If apostleship is not conveyed by man, then how is it conveyed? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ directly chose his apostles. And the only exception was replacing Judas, which Peter was certainly authorized to do. And later on in the book of Acts, um, Matthias, who replaced Judas, was counted as one of the apostles. Paul is simply saying, I was also directly chosen by Christ to be an apostle. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul points to the fact that um, he had seen Christ in his resurrection. And I, I, I know you know the passage, but 1 Corinthians 15, um, verses 3 and 4, I delivered unto you, first of all, here's the gospel, by the way, the, the, uh, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he was seen of Cephas, Peter. Then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That is, they died. It's not like in church, you know. <laughs> <laughs> after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So Paul makes quite a point that indeed he was a genuine apostle appointed by Christ himself. And he makes that uh, similar point back in chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? So he points to the fact that he also had seen Christ in his resurrection. But he also mentions... Not only is he apostle appointed by Jesus Christ in verse 1 of Galatians, he says, and God the Father. This statement tells us something about the divine order within the Godhead. Scripture is clear. God is one God. Scripture is equally clear that God exists in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, when I say three persons, you know, sometimes uh, people who've never heard that terminology or young people growing up, they think, well, he's three people. No, he's not three people. A person is made up of someone who has a mind, a will, and emotions, those three elements of personality. Now, yes, people have those, but so does God. And in Scripture, you can distinctly show that the Father has his own unique mind, will, and emotions. Jesus Christ has mind, will, and emotions. The Holy Spirit has mind, will, and emotions. So one God and three persons. And so he mentions not only by Jesus Christ, but God the Father. Why would he mention that? Well, because of the divine order in the Godhead. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse... Three. Oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's 1 Corinthians, the one I'm looking for. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. It says, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now this verse is not talking about some kind of superiority or inferiority. God the Father is not superior to God the Son. And for that matter, um, 
men and women are not superior or inferior to one another. But there is a chain of command within the Godhead that the Father makes the decisions, the Son carries them out. And uh, so he, he mentions both in verse 1. Apostle by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, there's kind of a question, a little bit of a side light, but uh, I want to point it out. Who raised Christ from the dead? Well, technically, here it says the Father did. Uh, let's compare a couple of scriptures. Over in uh, John chapter 2, starting in verse 19. John chapter 2, verse 19. All right. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, what temple is he talking about? Verse 21, he spake of the temple of his body. Uh, so in John's gospel, Jesus says, Destroy this temple, in three days I will raise it up. Over in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, God the Father who raised him from the dead. And then uh, take a look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So there we have three different texts. One says that the Father raised Jesus from the dead. One, Jesus says that he will raise himself from the dead. And one says that the spirit raised him from the dead. So which one is right? All of them. <laughs> and there again, you, you just have that unity of the Trinity, right? You have the unity of the Godhead. Uh, all members of the Godhead were involved in the resurrection of Christ. And I believe that Paul brings this up for a purpose. And I've often mentioned this. When, when a writer of scripture wants to uh, express the greatest show of power, that God has ever demonstrated, inevitably they point to the resurrection of Christ. That must be a really hard thing to do, <laughs> particularly raise Christ, because I'm pretty sure the devil didn't want Christ raised. You know, he, he got the, the Roman authorities to seal that tomb, you know, and, and did everything in his power to keep Christ from being raised. But, of course, God could do that. Now, why would he mention that in this context? Well, you know, the resurrection proves Christ's victory over sin uh, and the power that he gives to the believer to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul mentions the resurrection to show that the very power and authority of the entire Godhead was behind his apostleship which is very significant. And, and then Paul emphasizes the unique nature of his apostleship. Uh, Kenneth Wiest is, is one of the classic uh, scholars of, of uh, the Greek New Testament. He makes this comment on verse 1. By adding this qualifying phrase, referring to uh, God the Father who raised him from the dead, by adding this qualifying phrase, Kenneth Wiest mentions this, Paul emphasizes the fact that whereas the other apostles were commissioned by the Lord Jesus while he was in his humiliation, he himself was given his commission by the resurrected, glorified Christ. That's a really good point. And this is exactly what sets Paul's apostleship apart from the 12. Now I just want to give you, I put a little chart on the back of your notes. 
Uh, I just want to quickly go through some of the distinctions between the apostleship of the twelve and the apostleship of Paul. And, and by the way, we're really going to see this come out in, uh, in chapter 2, but I'm getting ahead of myself. First of all, the twelve were the apostles of God's earthly people, the nation Israel. Christ made that clear when Peter asked Christ in Matthew chapter 19, you know, what are, what are we going to have? We've given everything up and we've followed you. What do we get? And in, in verse 28, Christ says, you, you twelve, you know, you that have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you twelve will sit on the twelve thrones of Israel, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the earthly, we call it the earthly program, the kingdom of God on earth. That's the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Christ. That was their, their calling. Whereas Paul was the apostle of God's heavenly people, the body of Christ. Whereas Israel was told, the meek shall inherit the earth. We're told that in Christ, we're already seated in heavenly places. And so there is that distinction. Secondly, the 12 followed the Lord in his earthly life, his, in his humiliation. Paul followed Christ in his glorification after his resurrection and ascension. The 12 apostles were chosen while Christ was on earth. Paul was chosen by Christ from heaven. Number four, the 12 were promised an earthly kingdom. You 12 will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Paul was promised a heavenly position with the body of Christ. Uh, Ephesians 2, 6, seated with Christ in heavenly places. And then, the 12, and this is most important to uh, what Paul's going to be laying out when you get to chapters, well, really the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. The 12 apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom. They offered to Israel that coming kingdom when Christ rules and reigns from Jerusalem, whereas Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God, which offers to the people of the earth an escape from this world someday to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So two different apostleships, two different programs and we'll see that developed in, in quite a bit of detail in the next couple chapters. So why is it important to recognize Paul's distinctive apostleship? I think first and foremost is salvation itself, the message of the gospel. Um, next weekend, Lord willing, I've been asked to do a conference in uh, Lancaster, Wisconsin. And uh, our dear brother Jack Trum called me several months ago. He says, uh, we have a subject we'd like you to cover at our conference. We want you to talk about salvation and rightly dividing the word of truth. I said, you got it. I can do that. <laughs> but why is it so important to distinguish Paul's apostleship? Because what did, what did Peter and the 12 apostles preach? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. What did Paul preach? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So that's a big difference. The second reason why Paul's distinct apostleship is important is because of Christian living itself. Christ told the 12 apostles in Matthew 23, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatever they bid you, that observe and do. What does that mean? Obey the law. Obey the law of Moses. That's the message that was given to the 12 apostles. What was the message given to Paul? Romans 6, 14. We are not under the law, but under grace. That's a big difference in how you live the Christian life. A third reason it's important to understand Paul's distinct apostleship is that we might understand prophecy. Christ taught his 12 apostles in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, and by the way, when will that happen? Halfway through the tribulation period. When you see that happen, you head for the hills, right? You get out to the hills of Judea. 
Paul says, we're not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. So there's so much confusion on prophecy these days because they're trying to preach the message that was given to the 12. We're going to go into the tribulation. Not the message that was given to Paul, the blessed hope, that delivers us from the wrath to come. And then kind of a, I guess, a devotional and personal reason it's important to understand Paul's distinct apostleship is that it's the only way to truly rejoice in our heavenly position that God has given us in Christ. So uh, really looking forward to, uh, to spending a lot of time with you in the, the coming months in the book of Galatians. And uh, read it. Read it through. You'll see things you never saw before every time you read through the Word of God. Let's bow our heads, shall we? If you've never trusted Christ, trust Him today. Um, we always share the gospel and invite folks to trust Christ at, uh, at the Lake Ministry. And uh, there, was, there was one week where uh, a man indicated that he, he wanted to trust Christ. And we just need to pray for those who have put their, their faith in Him and, and uh, that they grow in, in grace. And if you've never trusted Christ, do so today by believing the gospel of his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, thank you for the book of Galatians. We're excited about studying it and understanding your message. That's as timely today and as important today as it ever was. And we just thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.